Welcome back to another edition of the Movement is a Lifestyle television show brought to you by FitLab Pittsburgh, a local Pittsburgh-based podcast, and the Zimmer Law Firm with Drew Zimmer. In the second part of the show, we'll have Maverick and learn a little bit more about proper training in the dogs. The whole idea or theory behind Movement is a Lifestyle is we want to encourage people to move and move any way possible. With today's guest, we've got something a little bit different. If you can see on my face, I actually have needles stuck in my face because today we are interviewing Francie Desmond of Navigating Wellness. Francie is an acupuncturist, and I didn't just randomly contact somebody and say, hey, come on, this movement is a lifestyle show and stick some needles in me. Rather, I see Francie on a weekly or biweekly basis. I think it's interesting to set up uh, how I first met Francie. Francie was introduced to me, and at that time I had a back injury and I kind of hobbled in because of muscle spasms and apologized for hobbling and Francie said, well, if you're interested, I might be able to help you. And I was quite uh, <laughs> non-believing, I think would be the correct term, but I figured what the heck, uh, can't hurt any worse. I went in and what the acupuncture allowed me to have is a relief of the muscle spasms I was having in my back for five or six days. It enabled me to actually do some rehab exercises and since then, I've learned that for some sinus problems and some complications that I've had due to numerous eye surgeries, it's beneficial for helping keeping my sinuses open. And Francie and I have joked about this before. It's like, does it actually work or is it the placebo effect? At the end of the day, if it helps me feel better, improves my quality of life, and encourages me to move more, then yes, it does work. So Francie, thanks for traveling <laughs> all the way down to the hinterlands from uh, the East Liberty area and talking to Movement as a Lifestyle. And you're welcome. Thanks for having me, Ben. I think one of the most interesting things for somebody who does an atypical career is you meet somebody and they say, well, what do you do? And you say, you're an acupuncturist. How do you explain to people when they say, well, what's that? It's a ancient um, natural healing modality. So the textbooks from China are 2000 years old they had an oral history a couple thousand years before that. So acupuncture is actually probably five to 10,000 years old. So it's been around longer. Um, even though with the needles, it seems like an intervention, it's actually pretty mild compared to surgery or uh, pharmaceuticals. And I think one of the most interesting things when I first met you and was talking to you, so many people in the movement field, they like to say, well, you have to do this and fill in whatever your favorite modality or exercise <laughs> is. And if you don't do that, you're an idiot or you're not gonna have the true benefits. The way you sold me on it, it was very low key. You said, well, it might help you, you can try it. And I know from knowing you for almost two years that you basically say, you know, for some people it works, for some people it doesn't. It's not a you have to do it. Yeah, nobody has to do anything really. It's a question of how open-minded you are to address your concerns. So one of the things I like about acupuncture is it's great for physical, mental, and emotional things. So whether you have grief or limited range of motion or pain or something else, it's um, after 20 years being in the field, I'm continuously amazed at what it's able to do. One of the interesting things that I've found about it is I use an aura ring, which I actually don't have on now, which measures sleep and measures relaxation. And when I wear that, when I have the acupuncture, one of the things I've noticed is it acts as a 45 or 50 minute resting period or meditation period. And it's not at all unusual when the needles are in that unless you and I get to talking that I actually fall asleep. So it's a very relaxing type of thing. So I guess one of the questions people would have, is it the fact that you have needles put in in specific spots at the body? Or is it the fact that that's 45, 50, 60 minutes where you can just relax and kind of get away from all of the, for lack of a better term, noise in the world? Mm -hmm. An acu-nap, some people call it an <laughs> acu-nap. Um, it is, it, I always take it as a compliment when people snore because I know that they're super relaxed, right? And it seems kind of counterintuitive, but when they get into that deep restful state, um, even if you were to lay down on the couch for a half an hour, you might not get that same depth of rest and rejuvenation. And I know one of the things, I know you and I also periodically go to a rolfer. And one of the things that I've noticed with both rolfing and acupuncture is I've never left a session feeling worse than I've come into it. 
So again, I don't know if it's the physical or the psychological, but th the overall goal is to move better. Um, acupuncture is great for increasing circulation, reducing the stress, and um, a lot of pain and mobility issues are muscles stuck in contraction, that they've been injured or torqued or twisted in some way, and um, as great as rolfing and deep tissue and all these other modalities are, they can't get in under the skin to reset that muscle belly. And one of my jokes I make with a number of people, including you, is I'm 52 years old now, so I'm like the classic car. So by doing rolfing, by doing mobility work, by doing acupuncture, by running, biking, et cetera, what I am is I'm the classic car who constantly needs a little bit of tweaking so I can keep on going down the road. I've actually taken that from you and started using it in my practice. And I think probably many people who are listening to this and watching this aren't aware of what acupuncture is as far as what is the training. So what's the training it takes? I'm sure I can't just go out and get on the internet and say, oh, I'm an acupuncturist now. What training did you have to go through before you could become a licensed acupuncturist? Uh, it's a minimum three years master's degree. Uh, you have to have a bachelor's for most schools now. Um, when I went um, over 20 years ago, that was there were some schools where you can grandfather if you had an associate's degree. Um, because I transferred schools, I was in school for five years, which is unusual for that level of training. And I know we've got some samples of things that you use on the table, which we'll get to in just a second. But let's talk about the needles that are on the camera. You've stuck some needles into my face, and I don't know if that's the terminology that you use when you're talking professionally, but what, are this, what is the purpose of these needles other than to look good on television? Um, this is a great treatment, particularly this time of year, for um, sinus and um, all this kind of congestion, whether you have a cold, allergies, whatever, um, these points here and here open up the sinuses. Um, but it's also good for treating the eyes. So if we were to just, if we were to add in eye points, then we could go up and above and around. I do have some people I do that for. And I know people are going to wonder with this, how big are the needles? I mean. My, one of my concerns when I first started coming to you is I hate needles. I'm a kid who uh, had a displaced fracture of my lower leg when I was a kid, and they offered uh, me a shot before they set it, which involved traction. And my comment was, no, no, I'm okay, because I still remember I was six years old. I hated the idea of needles. So of course I grabbed my dad's hand and probably almost broke it, <laughs> and they pulled traction. I remember it was very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I remember the first time I have a cavity, I didn't want to have Novocaine, and as I twitch around in the, t in the chair, the dentist says, why don't we try some Novocaine? So what's the size of these needles, and how does that compare to something that the watchers may know or be familiar with? These are some of the smallest needles that they make, actually. These are half inch. Um, I don't know the gauge on these, 14s. So these are like a um, 40 gauge needle. Um, it, m most people, when they think of acupuncture and the pain that they think it, ca it, it you would get from it is usually from a, um, what do they call those cutaneous needles with a hole in them I'm sorry I'm just having a um, brain freeze there but I'm not injecting anything into the body or taking anything out these are solid needles and these are some of the small there's actually ones that are smaller most of the needles I use are um, 36 to 40 gauge so they're super thin thinner than your hair most of the time you can't it's not like a sewing needle that's solid you can't even uh, pick out a, um, a splinter with one of these needles. They have that much flex in them. And I know that sometimes, you and I have talked before, too much flex is a bad thing. So the different gauges of needles and the gauge basically refers to the thickness. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about why, you, why or when you would want to use a thinner needle versus why or when you would want to use a thicker needle. Well, I'm one of these sensitive people that don't like needles either, so I'm all about the thin needles. And, and consequently, in my practice, I tr attract people who are also sensitive, um, because actually transferred schools from one to the other to um, get better at um, my needling. Um, I've really focused on that. Sometimes if, it depends on which muscle you're going into. So if you're going into the low back or the glutes or a larger muscle belly, then you would want a thicker needle. Um, they actually, since I started, they have um, sp more sports related. The, the variety of needles from when I started 
school over 20 years ago to now is um, quite advanced, actually. And I know one of the things that, that you do is there's always continuing education, both for requirements to maintain the licensure and also because you want to learn more. And recently, a few months ago, you went to a face seminar and you came back with different needles, which is, I believe, <laughs> what I have in my face. Yeah. And I'm one of those people who's somewhat sensitive, and the reason we didn't put the needles in on air is because sometimes I make little yelps, not because it's incredibly uncomfortable, it's no worse than plucking a hair out, but it doesn't feel good initially feel when it. it goes in sometimes. Yeah. So I think the continued change. But I also know that when we were working on my back, when I had back spasms, one time we actually bent a needle. Can you talk a little bit about how that happens or why that happens and what you did to get the needle out because it's not normal, but it's not abnormal either. It does happen actually a couple times a year uh, when I put a needle in. Um, because the muscle stuck in contraction, it's very tight. And when I put the needle in, it releases it. And sometimes it I've seen 45 degree angles. I've seen circular. Um, the other day I actually pulled one of those out of somebody's leg and um, that's how much force is actually in the muscle when it releases. And along those same lines, there clearly is a skill involved. I mean, you've mentioned the fact that it's at least a three-year three master's program, but we all know whatever the profession is that involves handiwork, there is a skill involved. And so, so when somebody is out there and they're hearing this and they're saying, you know, I might like to try acupuncture, but I've just heard Ben describe it, and it sounds like it could be a little painful. What are some tips for people who are looking for an acupuncturist? What should they look for as far as how do I find somebody who is not only qualified, but also somebody who's going to not cause me pain and say, hey, pain is good? Well, the first thing you could do is, is to do a Google search for who's around you. I just booked uh, a couple yesterday because they wanted somebody close to them. Um, lo look them up. They should, um, in Pennsylvania, you're not required to have the national boards, although many of us do maintain them. Um, word of mouth is a big thing. If you know, ask around the people that you know. Um, and like with anything, if you're not happy the first person that you go to, feel free to try others. You know, um, I've seen people that have been to three or four other acupuncturists. Uh, if I feel like I can't do it for you, I will refer you to somebody. I worked at McGee for five years and people would call from a couple hours around the area and I just had a list and I'd be like, try this person, try this person. Um, but you always want to look to make sure that they have gone to school, they are credentialed, there are people out there putting needles in that have weekend courses, they are not legal uh, licensed acupuncturists. And I know this is a good time to just give a, a brief definition or the differences between acupuncture and dry needling because if you're involved in more conventional medicine, uh, some physicians and depending on the state, some physical therapists and chiropractors do something called dry needling, which my understanding is I've never had it done, but my understanding is it can be quite painful. Kind of describe your understanding of the differences between acupuncture and dry needling, aside from the fact that an acupuncturist is going to have three years post-college uh, of actual education on acupuncture. Um. In some states, physical therapists and chiropractors can do needle insertion, which they call dry needling, which is a certain technique specific for orthopedic and musculoskeletal stuff, um, which is part of what I do. I do have extensive training in orthopedics. Um, it's, it's not necessarily an overview. One of the things that sets us apart is we are um, really looking at the overall health of the person versus just the arm, because there can be many contributing factors to why something um, is out of place that would need treatment. Um, 450 hours doesn't scrape the surface on, <laughs> on what I went through for school. I, I have... Um, mm, over 2,000 hours of training um, in school and at least 1,000 hours on top of that. And I know you've been in the uh, field for quite a few years. We won't mention how many years. I know I've talked to uh, a number of chiropractors that I know and they say, you know, 
just because I graduated with a degree, it took me a number of years before I felt comfortable with some of the things. When you graduated from uh, acupuncture school, how long did it take before you truly felt comfortable treating patients and doing a variety of conditions, or is that something that it's every day is a new day? Uh, thankfully, every day is a new day and I get to learn new things. And really, my clients have taught me over the years how best to treat. Um, when you graduate, basically, you've learned how not to hurt people. Um, and for the first couple years, I would say, well, I'm told that this should be the case. And I think it was after maybe five years, I was like, okay, I can expect this, this, or this. Um, but still, every person's different. People who I thought would resolve things quickly didn't, and people that I thought would leave right away stayed. So it, it's hard to judge, but after three to five appointments, I have a pretty good idea of how well somebody's gonna respond and how well I can help them. And I'm curious, you mentioned you worked at McGee for a, a number of years, I think you said five years, and I know that there are some other medical facilities that have acupuncturists on staff. Why is it not more mainstream or why is it not offered as another form of treatment for people when they go to their family practice physician or when they have uh, various types of injuries or discomfort if it's relatively non-invasive? Oh, there's so many ways <laughs> to answer that question. Um, I think partly because people still think of it as an experimental modality, even though it's thousands of years old. In the US, it's only been here about 40 years. Um, I think partly people don't know who to refer to because everyone, you wanna to refer to somebody of quality who you know can get the job done. And then there's the bridging the gap of language between Western medicine and Eastern medicine. And I think one of the interesting things that I've experienced with you and that you've covered so far is you've mentioned along the lines of it shouldn't hurt. And I know there's been a number of times when I've had a spasming in my back and we're here to try to relieve the spasming. You started to put a needle in and I've kind of jumped off the table and you said, well, we're not going to go there today or we could go there today, but you're going to be very uncomfortable. So we're not going to do it. I think the other thing that's interesting is the fact that you say you're constantly learning and finding new tools and I think the continuing education with the thinner needles which makes it much more comfortable <laughs> for me not that it was uncomfortable is very important and then the fact that if what you also mentioned is for some people you may not be the right acupuncturist it doesn't mean that it's a bunch of hogwash or doesn't necessarily work it may mean for some people acupuncture doesn't work it may be for some people you are the wrong acupuncturist or the right acupuncturist but I think the interesting thing is it opens up a variety of options for people who maybe are continually undergoing that tweaking sensation that I have as you get older because things wear out, things tweak, and trying something unusual or different. If you told me two years ago I was gonna sit here with needles in my face, first of all, I wouldn't have thought I had a television show, and second of all, I would have said there's no way somebody's sticking needles in me because I don't like needles. But there are also other things to do, right? It's one of them is needles, but also, for example, um, have this uh, stuff called moxa wool that I can put on the needle or directly on the skin. Um, cupping, I don't have cups with me today. Um, gua sha, which is a scraping, massage. There are so many things that uh, you can do as an acupuncturist that are above and beyond, and I'm certainly willing to negotiate the treatment so that it works for you. And I think I'm the perfect example of negotiation because I am unfortunately have a reputation of maybe being a difficult patient because I always ask questions. But I think what you've hit on that is key is the fact that you have a toolbox of tools. So I think anybody who's looking at moving all of their life, somebody who recognizes there's going to be times when they move more because their lifestyle allows it, they move less making acupuncture maybe as something you keep in your toolbox, oh, this isn't working well, can be just as valuable as physical therapy, personal training, or eating correctly. So I wanna thank you for taking time to talk to us. People who are interested more in your business, where can they find more information about you? Uh, my uh, website is navigatingwellnessllc.com or you can call me 412-494-8477. We've been talking with Francie Desmone of Navigating Wellness for this first part of Movement is a Lifestyle. For the second part, we're gonna have a new visit with Maverick, who's gonna teach us some new tricks and talk about 
using your dog. Actually, Drew's gonna talk about using your dog and having a well-trained dog. So Francie, I wanna thank you for traveling down here and taking time to talk a little bit about acupuncture. You're welcome, Ben, thanks for having me. We're back with Movement is a Lifestyle. We're here with Drew Zimmer of the Zimmer Law Firm, the co-sponsor along with FitLab Pittsburgh, and of course the star of the show, Maverick. Every session of Movement is a Lifestyle, we're gonna to talk to Drew and Maverick's gonna listen and then demonstrate what he's able to do. I know Drew, we were talking before we started recording, you said you wanted to talk a little bit today about, first of all, rewards. I know you mentioned in our first episode that the only way a dog is gonna do what you want it to do is if you're offering them something that's more interesting than maybe they're looking out at the uh, people filming. And then the second thing you wanted to touch on, which I think is really important, is safety too. So we'll throw it over to you to explain to us what we should be doing with our dogs. Maybe we're doing it, maybe we're not doing it. Yeah, no, great, thank you. Yeah, so just kind of recapping is that um, these guys, and he's got, we've got a lot of good attention right now, he's getting excited, is just, they have to work for something that they, they want. And so that could be um, maybe a, a treat. And he'll, he likes that, he likes food. Um, we've got other things here, this is a Kong toy. He likes his Kong. Kongs are great because um, we can throw them and they activate a prey response in the dog. And so, you know, when I throw it, it bounces all kinds of crazy directions and it just makes him want to go after it. And so Kongs are a great tool. And um, do you fill the Kong with food or peanut butter or something like that? I will. And so we do that a lot because, you know, if I've got to leave or go to work, you know, I'll fill this with sweet potato and other kind of you know good things for him a little bit of yogurt and freeze it and then let him you know try to lick it out and work on it for like an hour and it's a it's a good release for him and gives him something to do um you also notice it has holes on both ends and this is a safety thing um you know dogs unfortunately get hurt and die every year because they choke on objects um and so this is that way if it got lodged in his throat he could still breathe while you work to get it out um you'll notice i do not have a tennis ball or ball with me um Dogs, larger dogs like him, German Shepherds, they can easily choke on balls. Um, I, I do have training balls. Uh, they have a rope on them to pull them out if you ever had to, and they have holes the way they can breathe if they get stuck. Um, I won't say not to use balls, but always be incredibly careful. And that's a, a big thing that most people don't think about, you know, right? They'll use a, a tennis ball with, with a dog, and they don't think when that dog kind of runs across a field and, and catches it in the mouth, that is just a little slip away from choking on it. So we try to use a lot lar larger objects with these dogs because they get so worked up. Um, the other one that we have he likes is this is a, a tug roll. He's, he's sniffing it. And he likes this because we can kind of fight for it a little bit. He likes to play tug. We'll see if he might engage here a little bit and wants to play. And so he, see, this is what he likes to do. And believe it or not, there you go, you get it, plots. He loves to play tug. That's the biggest reward for, for him. Yeah, they're all different. And that little bit of interaction with me where we're kind of fighting for it, that that's he'll do anything to have that and I think that's an important point that you touched on a little bit that maybe you can focus on a little more for your specific dog is finding out what's the reward that they want I know you were mentioning that it, before Maverick reached a certain age or before he had some health problems he really wasn't a food driven yes. dog and I know some dogs are not food driven I know other dogs I mean I've had dogs that literally I could train them with Cheerios, whereas maybe Maverick would go, yeah, that's not good enough for me. Yes, and it's not a breed thing. I think people think, oh, he's a German Shepherd, that makes sense, he would wanna maybe play like that. But yeah, I, I train with a lot of folks with a lot of different dogs, and it's truly dog to dog. Um, whether it's food, tugging, um, honestly, just kind of like a, a bond with the handler sometimes is all they want, just a little bit of praise can be all that the dog wants. Um, yeah, so Maverick, before he had his EPI, and we'll talk about that more another time, um, he, he really wasn't into food. Uh, he didn't care, he was really, it had to be something like steak or really high value to get into it. And then moving forward, once he had that kind of sickness and, and that, that all happened, he, he really wanted food a lot after that. So now he's got a whole hierarchy of treats that he really likes. And how is it with somebody who has a dog, how do they find out what's their 
reward? Is it just really making the dog not an accoutrement and a family member and you kind of have spent time with Maverick? I think he's a yeah. little bit over five yeah. and just kind of like, okay, I know when I do this or my daughter does this or my wife does this, this is really good. And other things, he's kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to go in the corner and sleep. Yeah, you can and you can even see it here, right? I mean, he was kind of checking out what I had up here. He was getting excited. He was almost he was crying for this tug. He's got his chin on it. I mean, he really wants it. That's his toy. Um, this last one that we have here, then this is what we call a, a a grip wedge, and this is something we use more for the sport, and it, it lets him target, and it, it's kind of more like the, the size of a sleeve. And he likes to same thing. He'll tug, but he likes to target and grip into this. And so again, he like he wants to tug. Ouse, sit, nine, sit. We'll let him do a quick little target here. Pucking. There you go. Plots. And so, plots. He likes the big toys that he can carry around. He's got some weight and size to him. Well, no, we're not going to cry for it. Plots. Maverick. Plots. So he likes these larger toys. Um, so going back to, to last episode, you know, right, we talked a lot about making eye contact and getting this engagement with a dog. And so this kind of brings it full circle to me is just because we want to end of the day be able to find what that dog wants. I can't ask him to make eye contact and then heal and jump over objects and retrieve things and do anything if I cannot find what's gonna make him be willing to do that. And so this was just a sample of some of the things that we use to motivate him. And moving forward, we can keep talking about that, but the big key is what you said. You have to find what your dog wants to work for. It could be Cheerios, it could be string cheese, it could be pats on the head, it could be tugging, it could be a tennis ball. Um, you just have to tap into what your dog wants. And I think the great thing that you've demonstrated the two times we've had Maverick on is the fact that it's not just the dog that's engaged, you're engaged. I notice with the commands you give them, you don't give them two or three commands, one layered on top of the other. Sometimes you have to say the P word, I won't say it in yeah. case it aggravates <laughs> it, but sometimes you have to say it once or twice and you give them 10, 15 seconds before it. So I think that's a great message going forward is safety with your dog, training with your dog, it takes time. And hopefully next time you'll join us for another episode of Movement is a Lifestyle with the star of the show, Maverick.